um, Water Data 18. Uh, my name is Paul Connell from ODI Leeds. The rest of the ODI Leeds team are here. If they could just put their hands up, say hello. It, there's Stuart and Amy, Catherine, you met um, uh, Dan on the way in and Claudia. So we'll be here to help you during the day. Uh, a couple of things, um, tea and coffee, just to help yourself when you need one, new one. If you could help us by putting the empties back on the trays and then we can stick them in the dishwasher, um, that'll be good. We have no uh, planned fires today or fire alarms. So if there is a fire in here, um, follow me out of that emergency exit. If there's just an alarm, we'll go out that way, right to the end of the corridor, down the stairs, and we'll meet in front of the Agra restaurant, if you know that. So that's that. Let's make sure I've got it all. The toilets just by the lifts, if you need them, the facilities. And then we've got uh, two points. So there are two rules um, uh, ODI leads for our innovation work. Uh, the first one is no tourists. So if you think you're here today to just watch and find out, and I'll just, um, uh, I'll just find out what's going on, um, that's not happening. So part of the deal today is you have to get involved, you have to join a team, you have to contribute, you have to try and build something today. So keep, please keep that in mind. And the second one is you've got to have fun. So this isn't a boring day, we want everyone to enjoy it and you have to have fun. So if you come with that attitude, so no tourists and have fun, I'm sure it's going to be a really successful day. So if we could just go back to the screen on here. Which we did have. Let me find that. Okay, so this is Water Data 18. If you find us on the web, odileads.org, events, Water Data 18, everything we've got about Water Data 18 is going to be on here. So all of the warm up work we've done, information about Yorkshire Water's commitments, work we've done together about what people might want to look at. The data, useful links to all of the data, that's coming next, so I'm not going to go into that. We've got a live stream that's happening right now, so um, we're just going to live stream the first part of today and tomorrow when people are presenting their uh, proposals or pr propositions or prototypes or websites or solutions, um, that'll be live streamed as well. And then we've got our hackpad, so if you start to work on anything, so that everyone benefits and we've got an asset that everyone can learn from and take forward. We've got a hackpad that we put together, basically just a Google Doc. And we are, um, if you could, just let's look at this. Join in. So notes, photos, discussion, concepts, put them in here. That means you've got a record and we have two. And then I, we've also put in some work to identify some potential themes. But if you hold that point, if you want to have a look at that whilst we're talking, that would be great. And I'd like to introduce you now to Richard Emmett, um, who is just going to go through a bit of why we're here from Yorkshire Waters' perspective. So if I get a microphone for Richard, he can say hello. There you go. Thanks very much, Paul. Uh, and uh, first of all, welcome to uh, Water Data 18. Uh, 
I'm not going to say very much because the person you really want to listen to is Rob, and I'll come to that in a second, but I thought it was worth saying welcome uh, and a few thank yous uh, along the way. Uh, it's, I can't say how exciting it is to be here today. It's only a few months since we started out on the uh, sort of open data journey, uh, ably assisted and helped uh, by our colleagues at the ODI. Uh, it's only a few weeks since we actually did our first data release, uh, thanks to Rob, 75 million lines, uh, recently augmented by some additional data sets that he'll explain shortly. So actually to be in a position where we're going to see people engage and kind of work with it uh, and come up with some different perspectives uh, is incredibly exciting. Uh, I was chatting with some of our leakage colleagues earlier uh, at the beginning when I first arrived and, and they're here and on hand to kind of help you out and work with you. Uh, and they kind of, I think, summed it up quite nicely, basically saying they spent probably 20, 20 years looking at this data, at the night lines, etc. And it'd be really interesting to find out uh, if anyone can find some fresh perspectives, some different uh, amalgamations with that data uh, that we haven't seen so far. So that kind of, in some ways, sums up the purpose of the day. Um, so a few thank yous, if I may. Uh, I mean, first and foremost, to, to kind of Rob. Um, so when we started out on the open data journey, we kind of needed advocates and you know, people who are passionate about this in the business who could actually make it happen. Rob's really stepped up. He kind of personally cleansed that 75 million lines himself uh, and has really worked very hard on this with his team uh, to kind of make this happen. So it, it's pretty clear to me that we wouldn't be here um, today without Rob's input to that. So, uh, so many thanks for that. Also to our colleagues at the ODI who've kind of guided us hand in hand gently through the, uh, the process so far, given us some interesting sort of tips on where we may go next. Uh, and that uh, is, uh, is very important. And I think the start of an interesting partnership uh, with the ODI and also the, you know, the basis of, of some partnerships with other organizations here in Leeds, the councils, uh, the agency, I think the environment agency and, and universities, etc. So we don't know where this road will take us, but there's lots of opportunities for us um, to do some interesting things uh, along that way. Also, uh, thanks to uh, Clive from the uh, Ordnance Survey, who I think has uh, very kindly uh, brought some API keys to some of their mapping um, data, which I think will be a, a great assistance uh, in sort of matching the, the topography effects on some of the leakage data. So many thanks for taking the, the trouble to do that today. Uh, one other introduction and a little bit of explanation about where we might go next with this. So we've also got some colleagues from PA Consulting here who've been doing some work in the service delivery part of our business on kind of use of data to kind of give us some uh, just different perspectives on how we might organize our resources. They're now doing a bit of work as to how we can kind of incorporate open data solutions into some of our processes. Uh, and I give them a specific kind of challenge to kind of look at how we can develop some procurement routes um, that are kind of more suited to open innovation and open data. Uh, because I'm absolutely convinced that if we're going to take this from being a kind of reputational and engagement exercise into something that's got commercial advantage for us and indeed for everyone in this room, then we need to have that. There needs to be a kind of commercial outcome uh, to this for, for both parties. So uh, the colleagues from PA will be participating in the day, but also kind of learning and coming up with some ideas that we can incorporate into the way we run, we, uh, run the business. Just on the kind of outcome of the day, of the, of the couple of days, um, Paul and the team have come, come up with some very imaginative prizes, all of which have a suitably corny water theme, um, uh, but uh, which is great. Um, I'm sure there'll be party bags at the end of it uh, as well as we go along. Um, but I'll also just throw something else out there, which kind of gives it, which comes back to the um, sort of commercial imperative. We also were kind of figuring out what might be useful to people uh, participating. And we reckon that basically that the, we'll, we'll take the best sort of five ideas, prototypes or proposals, and they'll get the chance, the people who've done those will get the chance to present those to our director of service delivery and our director of asset management. So you can kind of get an access in at the sort of most senior levels of decision makers around this sort of stuff. So hopefully that'll be a, a, you know, a valuable opportunity for you. They don't know that yet, um, but I'll tell them about it later and, it, and I'll make sure that it, uh, that it happens. So that's enough for me. I'll need to hand over to Rob. Uh, I'll be dipping in and out over the next couple of days and I hope to talk and engage with you as the event progresses. I hope you enjoy it uh, to fulfill the second rule and uh, welcome and thank you very much for coming. Cheers. Thank you, Richard. Um, 
I'll just explain to you a little bit about how the day is going to run and how today runs into Saturday and a bit about the, the structure. So in a second, um, Rob and Jim, Jason, Rob and Jason are going to go through the data, explain the data we've got um, and the objective. It's a load of data about pipes and leaks and positions and Yorkshire, so it's, it's, it's um, really, really quite interesting. Um, and there's a lot of that data, so they're going to explain what it is, where it is, how you can find it, how you can use that data. What we're going to do after that is then go through a... Um, uh, we, as a room, are going to decide what we're going to work on. So we've got some themes which we're going to show to you. We've got them on here. Um, if you can start thinking of uh, what your priorities are, how you might work now, or you might have done it before, and that would be great. We're then going to talk about what themes we want to work on and whether they work for us. So the room is going to decide that. And then we need some team formation, so team, people working together to work either under those themes on a specific part of that. So have a think about that as well. We've got some process to do that. So this morning is all about um, broadcasting the information to you, showing you where it is, what the priorities for Yorkshire Water are, what the priorities for us are as a, as a, um, as a collective uh, this morning. And then hopefully by lunchtime we have identified some teams um, that are going to work on um, stuff this afternoon. The objective this afternoon is to develop a proposition, a theme, a, uh, a I guess a process or, a, or an objective that we're going to work on. And then if you want to join us tomorrow, um, you can then actually build those out into a, uh, a working prototype. So tomorrow is all about building the working prototype. Today is all about um, working out what we're going to build. Um, if you want to go and test it with people in the, um, in the city, you're more than welcome to do that. If you want to test it with people here, uh, you're more than welcome to do that as well. Every team that joins us uh, tomorrow that gets to uh, four o'clock-ish with a, and presents a prototype will get a prize. Um, we'll share with you a little bit later about the imaginative prizes. There are some pretty cool ones and there's also some fun ones. So if you really want a new paddling pool, stick around till tomorrow. If you might want a kayak, there's one of those as well. So we've got a, a luxury yacht stroke kayak in there as well. So if that's on your list uh, or your, you know, your bucket list, uh, join us uh, for that. So what I'd like to do now is get Rob to start talking through the data. Um, and if everyone, um, before we have that talk, if everyone can just um, stand up. And if, if, who's, if you put your hand up, if you're sat next to someone you know. Okay. Could you all go and find a seat where you are sat next to someone you don't know? No, 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 no. You can't just move around the table. You have to go and sit and be next to someone you don't know and not be met before at all. So there's two people from PA Consulting here. You are not allowed to sit and talk to each other. You need to move. The Oakland group, there's a little bit of group there if you need to move away as well. So, yeah. Can't see anyone moving. So find a new seat. Yeah. There's plenty of seats down this end. Come on, they say. Great stuff. So there's three people. You still know each other, don't you? Come on, there's this, this table here. Yeah, fantastic. What I'd like to do now is to say hello to someone sat next to you. There's some of the threes or fours. Say hello to someone you don't know, not met. No, so, so, like, so the two people from PA, you need to move. You need to move. Okay, so the next part of the next part of the uh, next part of this exercise. Um, once you've said hello to each other. I want you to, you've got, uh, you've got three minutes, which I'm going to tell you. You've got one minute to describe who you are. 
and then the other person has to describe who they are and what they do. You've got one minute, and then you've got the next minute to talk about something you might be able to work together on in the future. So you've never met before, so you need to introduce yourself to each other, and then you've got one minute to work out something you might want to work on in the future. So, go. So you two, you, you two, oh man, I like that, yeah.
Okay, okay, so uh, hopefully you enjoyed that because that's rule number two, don't forget. And you've met some new people and you might have made some new friends, which is all good. Um, we've just got uh, the slides have just come through this morning, so we're running a bit seat of the pants, but the second presentation is just being loaded up, which you can see here. And then next we're going to have Rob. So Rob, if you could introduce yourself. And then we'll get your slideshow up. So just say hello, and then we'll get you up. Can everybody hear me? Is this on? No. Hello. Uh, there we go. OK. Right, so good morning, everyone. My name's Robert Krempick, and I'm the manager of asset analytics at Yorkshire Water. My slides are just about to appear now. There we go, fantastic, seamless. Thank you. Excellent. So I'm going to talk this morning about the leakage DMA data that we've already released and is out there on the Data Mill North. I'm also going to highlight some of the challenges and opportunities that link with this data. Now, I know some of you are here at the launch event, and some of the information I'm going to cover here does relate to and covers some of the things that were, were touched on at the launch event, but I think it's important that everybody understands what data we've released and the reasons for releasing that. So, first of all, a little bit of background. Yorkshire Water serves a very large and diverse area, and to make the management of the water supply efficient, we split this large area into 2,000 smaller areas called district metered areas or DMAs. Now each of these 2,000 DMAs contains all of our domestic customers and most of our small commercial customers. So to ensure that the customers are getting the supplies they need and the water's coming through correctly, we monitor the flow every 15 minutes in each of our DMAs. And that enables us to efficiently and effectively respond to any issues that can occur, hopefully before the customer sees the issue, but ultimately reducing any impact for customers. So each DMA is very different in its nature, but the average DMA contains around 1,000 domestic properties and approximately 50 commercial properties. But as I've mentioned, they're very different uh, in the way they're built up, and that reflects the different nature of the water network and the way that's set up across the whole region. And as such, they also pick up very different customer habits and customer traits due to the diverse uh, population we have across the Yorkshire region. So if you look on the right-hand side there at the top of the slide, you'll see a daily profile for three different DMAs. And if I just pick out the green one first, what you can see there is what's commonly referred to as a diurnal profile. So you can see the flow bottoms out overnight, that's when usage is at its lowest. There's then a rise in the morning when people get up, get ready for work, get ready for school. There's a lull typically occurs through the day, and then as people get home, prepare food, have showers, have baths, and ultimately go to bed, you can see the usage peak and then tail off. And the process then repeats itself the following day. Now, if you contrast that to the, the DMA that's shown in blue there, you'll see that that bottoms out at a similar level overnight, and there is an increase seen in the day, but it's not picking up the same morning and evening peaks that we see on the green one. And finally, adding into that mix, you can see the yellow line there, and this has a totally different profile altogether to the other two. So again, just reflecting the very diverse nature of the area that we serve. So what information are we releasing then, or in fact, have we released? Well, ultimately, it's all of this 15-minute flow data for a full financial year. So this has been released for every DMA with six or more domestic properties and six or more commercial properties. So this is over 2,000 of our DMAs. In total, it's a sizable data set. There's over 75 million rows, and the top handful are shown over here on the top right there. In addition to that, we released property count data. So within each DMA, you'll be able to see what the number of domestic and commercial households is. And that, an example, sorry, the top few lines is shown in the bottom right here. Now, when we presented at the launch event, 
there was much discussion about how do we link this data set with other data sets that are out there that might enable us to look in a different light about what's happening across the region. One of the key factors that was picked up was a, a geographic factor of some shape or form. Now the challenge in providing that is trying to find something that's granular enough to be meaningful, but equally large enough to be compliant with data privacy regulations. And so what we've been able to do is provide the postal sectors that exist within each DMA. So there isn't a neat mapping between DMAs and postal sectors. Some DMAs contain many postal sectors, others contain just one. But what we've got there is the full list of them, and we've captured the number of properties within each one, both household and non-household, so you can understand the weighting between the different sectors that's reflected in each DMA's flow. Now, to be compliant with data privacy regulations, we've made sure we've only included postal sectors with 20 or more domestic properties and six or more sh commercial properties. So this means a little bit of the data has been held back. However, we're still giving data that relates to 94% of the properties of Yorkshire, so it's still the vast bulk of the data that we hold that's been put up online on the data mill now. The next area we were asked about was around our mains repair data. So we've produced a list of every mains repair that occurred in that full financial year. So this covers the full 2,000 plus DMAs that have been released, and you can see the top few lines of that table there. So if you look at that, you can see there were three mains repairs in DMA1, and you can see the dates that those repairs occurred. So what is the challenge then around this data? Well, linking with it closely, um, there's an issue in separating leakage from consumption. So to explain that by way of an example, within a given DMA, we measure leakage by looking for the low point. Now the low point typically occurs overnight. So in this DMA there that we've zoomed in on, you can see that's where the low point of the flow is. Now even though that occurs overnight, there's still going to be an element of water use occurring. People who are potentially shift workers, for example, uh, coming home from work or getting ready for work, or equally just people using the bathroom and everything in between. So to understand the potential amount of water that's been legitimately used at that time, we have a sample of a thousand properties in Yorkshire who allow us to monitor their usage, and from that we're able to understand what the average customer of Yorkshire uses overnight. And we can then subtract that from the overall nightline position to account for that domestic use. In addition, there'll be some commercial use occurring, there'll be businesses that are finishing up for the night and getting ready for the next day. And so we have a model that's been built based on a, a sample of commercial properties across the region and takes into account the different types of industry that we're, we're likely to see. And we use that to then also give an allowance for the amount of commercial night use that we expect to occur within an area. And the resulting figure that's left, the gap at the bottom then, is assumed to be leakage. Now at a, a regional level, at a Yorkshire level, these assumptions and estimates are quite accurate. But when it comes down to looking at an individual DMA level, there might be more nighttime activity or less nighttime activity than the, the typical uh, customer would use. And so as such, leakage might be higher, or as shown there, potentially lower than what we're estimating it to be. Now the challenge with this is if we think there is leakage in an area, we could be sending people in, when in real terms people are actually just using that water, so there's nothing for them to find. Equally, if we think an area, uh, if we're underestimating the leakage in an area, then we might not be spotting where there are true leaks to find, and we might then be inefficient in where we're sending our people. So, as we want to move towards reducing our leakage by 40%, there is a real challenge here about being able to properly understand and separate out that consumption from leakage. So the stated challenge we've got around this data that links to that is can our customers and partners help us better understand customer usage patterns around the clock? Now when we discussed this at the launch event, there were lots of ideas that were um, produced and hypothesized. So we've captured some of them here to show some of the ideas that were discussed. 
typically they fell within these three broad factors. So the first one I've shown over there is weather factors. So things such as temperature. When you're seeing high temperature, you're potentially seeing more usage occurring at night. Equally, when you see high rainfall, there's a chance for less usage at night, less sprinkler usage, things like that. Equally, when we see extreme winter events, so when we see particular freeze-thaw events, like we saw in March this year with the beast from the east and things like that, the split between consumption and leakage can change at those times. And it's important for us to be able to try and get to the bottom of that. The next key area were human factors. So things such as demographic information and how that might help us understand the difference between the, the leakage and the consumption within each DMA. And then things such as school holidays or religious festivals, where for a short period of time, we see water usage being very different to its typical and normal pattern. And it's how we account for that in our calculations. And the final grouping of, uh, of key factors listed were really around area factors, so things such as topography, as has been mentioned already, housing type, and equally what industry is prevalent in each area. So these were some of the ideas that we had. And before I hand over to Jason, I think the final thing I'd like to say is, what we're interested in here is really getting to the bottom of how we split out that leakage and that usage. So if you can think of any ideas that aren't on there, we don't want to limit your thinking and your skills to just what's on that screen. If you can think of any other ways, we'd really love to hear from you over these next two days and try and help us get towards that position of reducing leakage by 40%. Thank you. Okay, any questions? I've got one. Yep. I've got one. Uh, where is the data? It's on the Data Mill North website. So if I just go back, there's the address. So you can find it on that link there, shown on the bottom. And there are links also from the water hack page on the data sheet. On our, on our hub page on the website, um, and if you just go into Dame on North and search Yorkshire Water, you'll be able to find the data sets. So does everyone know about Data Mill North? Has anyone not heard of Data Mill North? Okay, right. It's dead easy to find, but we can help as well if you need that. Any other questions? What format is the data in? The data's in CSV format, so it's usable in any system. Fantastic. Any other questions? I'm just going to keep. Okay. Could um, the Yorkshire Water people who are looking after data just put their hands up? Great. So if you need help, they're in the room and we can. Uh, they, then you've got. They're going to be here today and tomorrow in a. In yeah, a we've got coverage over coverage both Coverage over the day. Yeah. Great stuff. Okay. Jason, you're next. Yours. Oh, sorry, we don't want the notes lies on there. Sorry? We don't want the notes lies on there. No, let's have a look. So we okay. Morning everybody. So my name's Jason Griffin. I'm the manager of the leakage technology team at Yorkshire Water, which was set up around January time. Um, to implement all new leakage technology that's out there on the market at the moment. So as data-driven as Rob is, I'm very much a man-on-the-ground pipes, holes in pipes person. That's my background for the last 30 years at Yorkshire Water. I'm here today to speak about acoustic logging data or more, more than really talk about the data, more to explain the, the premise of how the loggers work how we deploy them, how we use them, and what we use the data for afterwards. So why has Yorkshire Water started to use a little bit more technology recently? Well, the main reason is we've set ourselves some very, very challenging targets. So we need to reduce our leakage levels by 40% over the next seven years. Um, we constantly have targets that we work against, but we've... Um, there's some regulator targets come in recently that we want to achieve, but we want to overachieve them as well. So we've set ourselves our own challenge of um, reducing these by 40%. So 
So I've been in leakage for quite a long time uh, as a leakage team leader, managing leakage inspectors that go out there uh, finding these leaks. And when I started to hear about these targets at first, I was a bit concerned, to say the least, about how we was going to do them. And I, I started to think we're going to have to start looking at other technologies um, a little bit to achieve the targets that they were talking about. So when we started to talk about acoustic logging and satellite leakage detection, it was music to my ears, to be honest. Unfortunately, I was, I was lucky enough to be offered the position to, to um, form a leakage technology team in January. So I'm not going to speak as much about the data now. I'm going to give you a bit of an explanation how leakage detection, um, traditional methods, how it compares with modern methods. So just a, a show of hands first. Who's got any idea in the room, apart from the Yorkshire Walk people, and some of them looking at them, I'm not so sure, know how we find leakage in Yorkshire water? A little bit? Yeah. OK. So traditionally, um, leakage was fairly straightforward and, and very basic. So over the years, technology has moved on, but we still use a lot of the traditional methods that we've used for many, many years. Now, that picture on the screen there shows uh, traditional leakage detection, and, and we still go back to that method these days to uh, pinpoint leakage. As you can see, there's three chaps there, sat, sorry, stood up with the listening sticks, listening for the leak on the ground there. The leak, the, and what they're trying to pick up is the vibration of the leak noise coming through the ground from the water main underneath. Now, if you look at that picture, one thing I'm glad to say is that technology might not have moved on, but thankfully health and safety and uh, personal protective equipment has moved on quite a lot in, since those days. Look at those chaps there, there's a big bus just gone past and they're in black uniforms on a very grey London day. So fortunately that's one thing that has moved along. So like I've said, we, do, we, we have started to use a lot of technology. It's not just all about the listening stick, but the majority of our traditional leakage methods is, is still very, very human reliant and human interpretation is, is a big part of it. So current methods, we only really use one set of data to target where we're going to send these leakage inspectors. Um, as Rob explained, Rob explained the night lines there um, and all the um, different factors that go into a night line. But for the leakage inspector, for, so for my guys, for the, the, the guys for all the teams in Yorkshire, this, where they are going to be sent is, is selected by a, a data analyst on the night lines that Rob's explained. So for example, that night line there, you can see it's plodding along nicely, consistently running at a similar sort of a level, and then suddenly the night line goes up at the end on the right-hand side there. So that's what we call in the trade a breakout. Now, leakage inspectors love a breakout. If they're being told they're going in to look for uh, leakage that's increased, they're chomping at the bit. They can't wait to get out because they can see that there's something there. But that's the easy side of it for a leakage inspector, to be honest. What we're trying to do now with the new technology, and and what we've always been trying to do, to be honest, is is that bit where it's stable there is to drive it down, drive it down to levels where we know we can, it, where it should be running at. Not what it's running at, but drive it down further. And that's the only way we're going to achieve the targets um, that we've, we've set ourselves. So a DMA, uh, as Robert's mentioned, is a district managed area in its most basic form. It's a water pipe going into an area that's locked in, so the water can't escape from that area. It's going to close valves. There's a meter at the boundary. The data from that meter is sent into our systems, net base, and that's where we get these night lines from. Um, the analyst, like I said, then takes all the other factors into consideration and will decide to send a leakage inspector in there to see if it can reduce leakage or find that breakout. So the traditional method, that's the schematic of a DMA, a random DMA somewhere across Yorkshire. As Rob mentioned, it can have between 50 to 2,000 properties at some stage. The guy will get told he's going into that DMA, this is what the leakage level is, and there's the plan. He'll be given a plan, and um, he'll set off on his merry way to try to find the leakage in there. Traditional methods are the chap will go in there, and he will walk around with his listening stick, listening on any accessible fittings that are on the water network, so valves, fire hydrants, washout hydrants, customer stop taps. 
He can start at the right hand side of the DMA and the leak might be on the far left hand side. So it could take him three, four, five, depending on the size of the DMA, a week, sometimes more to find that. So you've got to remember that the leakage teams are not responding to leaks that are showing. They, they go to another department, the field technician. So they're the easy ones. When a customer rings in and says, I've got water showing outside my house, they're straight there. The leakage teams have it very much more difficult. They've got to find leaks that aren't showing. When they get to that point where they're, they're picking up the leak noise, so that's what they're listening for on the valves and hydrants, a leak noise. Even at that point, then it's not job done. They've then got to go in and start to try and pinpoint where that leak is along that length of main between those two fittings where they've got the noise. So this is where some of the technology that we've had for years comes in. There's uh, something called a correlator where we connect to fittings either side of we think where the leak is and in its most basic form it sends a signal down the, down the water main and then sends a signal back from how far away the noise is, is coming. We've also got step testing, something called step testing. So if they're struggling to find the leak, or sometimes we do this um, before we even start walking, a step test is a controlled method of isolating parts of the DMA. So we can split it into three or four little pieces, if we like. And we can look at the night line. We can look at um, the, the logger data that's coming in. And when we get a big drop in one of those sections, we know the leak's in that area. But then we still have to go traditionally walking around in that small area to try and find where the leakage is. And the, the problem with that as well is that it has to be done at night because um, we're carrying out these controlled isolations and we won't carry these controlled isolations out during the day because firstly, we don't want to turn people's water off. But secondly, um, that's when hopefully most people are in bed tucked away and we get a better data result. So that's a bit about the traditional leakage methods. So now I know we're all here to talk about data and things like that. So we'll move on now to the acoustic logging um, side of it, which my team has started to uh, work on since January. So with acoustic logging, these are little devices that we've got. We've got 4,600 of them. Currently, we've got 2,200 this morning deployed. Um, we go into a DMA um, and we will we have a deployment team that go out and on the fittings and the valves and hydrants I was talking about previously that the inspectors go out and listen on, we'll, we will deploy a permanent logger on them, on, the, on these fittings. We'll do it across the DMA depending on um, what size it is, it depends on how many we will put out. Uh, the criteria that we use for putting them out is if it's a metallic main, metallic water pipes, we'll spread them 150 metres apart. And if it's a plastic main, uh, we'll spread them 50 metres apart because plastic mains don't carry the noise of a leak as far as uh, a metallic ones do. The data then that we get from the loggers, we get it overnight. Um, it'll tell us what the noise level is, and this is the data that Rob's shared um, with you all. It's, it gives us a noise level and how many different types of noises it's listening to as well, which I'll go on to explain later. Um, the beauty of this system, if some of you have already worked it out, is that this is telling us where the noises are in that DMA. So rather than the leakage inspector going out and having to walk around for potentially days before he finds that noise and then starts his investigation, this is telling us exactly where those noises are. Now I want to make it clear as well that these noises are not always guaranteed to be a leak. It can be another fitting our, on our system, such as something called a pressure reducing valve, which makes a lot of noise. It can be noise from a lamp post sometimes that's humming in the night. It can be noise from electric substations. But we still have to go out and investigate these points of interest and prove that there's no leakage there before we can move on and maybe change the alarm threshold on the, on the loggers. So straight away you can see the efficiency of these, we're going straight to the points of interest rather than spending the time walking around the DMA. So just a bit of a comparison between the two methods. So the traditional method, obviously, it's much less efficient, spending more time, more wasted time potentially, searching out that, that noise before we even start our investigations. In theory, we're working on just one piece of data, or the leakage inspector is, he's been told by the analyst that leakage is at this level or this level and it needs to be down at this level and then he's off on his way. 
And it's also reliant on a, a technician's interpretation of leak noise. So what to one leakage inspector, one leakage technician, might be a noise that he will spend a lot of time on trying to pinpoint this leak, uh, climbing over walls, jumping through hedges, you know, he will not give up on this leak. Other leakage inspectors might think it's not efficient enough, it's, it's not a prominent, prominent enough noise for him to spend any time on investigating it further. Whereas with acoustic logging, straight away, much better efficiency. Dr directing us, targeting us directly at where the noise are on this network. There's multiple ways of viewing what the logger is telling us with the noise level and spread, which I'll go on to show you in a second. We can carry out a lot of the checks back at the base. So this data is being sent into a cloud-based web portal. Uh, so we have analysts back in the office who are looking at this data. And as we get better at this data, which maybe today is about, we might be able to say, forget those two alarms. We can ignore those because it's telling us A, B, or C. Let's go to this other logger here that's telling us this. This is more like the, the trend of what we've found to be leakage. Just the fact that the logger is telling us that there's something there is, is that's causing that noise means that we don't walk away from it. We go there and we prove what's causing that noise. Whether it be a leak, whether it be a PRV on the system, whether it be a lamppost, whether it be a substation, we go in there and we have to prove what that is before we can walk away. And that's the motto in my new team is we don't walk away from a logger in alarm until we prove what it is. Because potentially that noise of that substation could be hiding the noise of a leak. So we need to go in and prove. We can also then, once we prove that, change the alarm threshold that these loggers go into alarm in. So when we can, we've proved there's no leak there, we change the threshold. Next time there is something new on the system, a leak, we can then go and say, that's something new. Let's get in there, let's investigate it. The beauty of these loggers is they listen lower than human beings can. So I was talking about the traditional methods that rely on a, a leakage inspector going out and listening to that noise. Um, well, if you're anything like me, you're, you're getting older, you're starting to lose your hearing a little bit, you're going to pick up less <coughs> noises. These loggers don't do that. They continue to log listen and they go down to a lower threshold than the human hearing can. Everybody okay with that so far? So now I'm just going to show you a bit about what we see back in the base from the loggers and, and you'll see the different um, views that we get, that the loggers are, are showing us. So when we look at a logger, um, it's giving us different bits of data. So the f this is split into, the, spleen, the screen's split into three different sections here. So the left-hand side, you can see the tabs at the top there. These are all the different tabs we can click at. So the first one on the left is, is just a fairly basic information about the logger. We have uh, an ID, an SMS number, the serial number, the date it last called in. So in theory, that should be the night before we're looking at it. And then the main bit now that Rob has shared um, on the data is the noise level and spread. The noise level is in decibels. The spread is how many different noise levels it's listening to. I'll go on to explain that in a really, really simple way on one of my final slides. So in the middle there, again, this is more apt to what we're talking about today, the open data. That's a history. We can look at the history since when the logger was deployed of what the logger was dialing in, what its noise level was and what it spread. And on the top one as well, you'll see that there, there's a sound file. We can also listen back in the office to the sound file that the logger sent in from the previous night, which is fantastic for us because previously we were relying on the leakage inspectors just out on site and their hearing. We can also look at the noise level and spread uh, data, which is on the right-hand side there in something called a histogram. So it's like um, a graph basically across the bottom, it's the, the decibels. And then on the right-hand side, it's how many counts of noise levels at that decibels it had that previous evening. And I'll go on to explain that later, like I say, in a really, really simple format. For those that are like me who are operational-based rather than database. Other things we can see from the logger, so on the left-hand side, the, the um, inspector who's deploying it, he takes some photos on site, three or more, so we can see that 
uh, if there's any problems in the future, we can see where that logger was deployed, if we need to go and retrieve it, if there's any issues. We have then have a picture in the middle of it actually in place. So it's a way of us validating and auditing that it was deployed correctly. And the bottom one is just a, um, a picture of the logger serial number and the data on there in case there's any issues in, in the future. Like I said, the big picture in the middle is, is the middle one from the left-hand side. That's just the logger in place. Now, if you remember earlier, I spoke about in the traditional methods when the leakage inspectors walked around for however many days and he's found a point of interest. He, he uses something called a correlator, which if you remember is something I said that you connect to the, the fittings and it sends a signal out and tells you how far away from your machine the uh, leak is or it suspects the leak to be. Well, we've also got with these loggers an auto-correlation function as well, so we can do that from the office. Now, it would only be a fool that sent a man straight from the office and said, get the contractors to dig up four metres away from fitting A, B or C. But it's, a, it's more of a confidence factor for us. It's, it's, it's a secondary thing telling us there's something there. Gives us more confidence when we're sending the chaps out to investigate. So now onto the data side of it that Rob shared with you on the acoustic logging. So the explanation of the, the noise level and spread. So the logger turns itself on at 2 a.m. in the morning and takes approximately 3,000 sound samples between 2 and 3 a.m. If it's similar to what it was picking up the previous night, that's it. It's done its work for the night. It shuts itself off. It goes back to sleep until the following night. If there's any changes, then it will take the calculations again between 3 and 4 a.m., and that's when it confirms it's the noise level and the, the, the spread of the noises that it's got. So the histograms at the bottom there are, are a good indication. We, we like to see tall, sharp histograms rather than small, spread out, wide histograms. It's more of an indication that there's potentially a leak there. And then on the right-hand side um, is Rob's picture there of the noise level and spread and the history of the loggers over all the dates that we've had them out. Now I'm going to really simplify stuff on the next stage. And th When I first started getting involved in these loggers, um, it took me a bit of time to understand the noise level and spread. So the best explanation I ever had given to me was this one by a chap from the company who provides them. Remember when you used to go to um, the local fair or something like that and you wanted to win a goldfish and you used to, th to throw ping pong balls into jars? That's what this is doing. So I spoke about the 3,000 samples that it's taking of that noise. Well, every time, if you like, it picks up a noise at a certain level, it puts a ping pong ball into a jar. The more of that noise the more your jar fills up, the more goldfish you're going to win. But then it might also pick up noises at other levels as well, so it'll put a ping pong ball into those. So the more you can aim it in that middle one there, and less on the outskirts, the more, the better noise it's telling you it's getting, it's listening to one noise rather than a lots of different things. So if it's listening to a lot of different things, it could be somebody turning the tap on, a business using at night. If it's listening to one consistent noise, then there's more chance that that's a leak or a consistent unaccounted for water or unaccounted for, uh, sorry, or usage. So I, I always use that because that was the best way I ever had it explained to me, the old ping pong balls into the, into the jars. So these loggers, like I told you, they go into alarm um, and that's how we direct our inspectors the, the following morning. So really, back to the first screen of data that we get, in their most basic form, these loggers do a calculation between the noise level and the noise spread. And currently it's set, although we have, as we've started to learn since January, we, we've, we've changed a few of these when we've investigated them. It'll go into alarm if the noise level minus the noise the, the level the noise level spread comes up with a figure of fifteen or over. As simple as that. Then it's down for us later on to interpret them and change them as we find um that it's a pressure reducing valve electric substation, that sort of thing. If it's so it's noise level minus noise spread 
comes out with a, a figure of 15 or above, they go into alarm. So Rob's put all this data where he's put it. Where is it, Rob? Thank you, Rob. Yeah. So one of the questions that when Rob came to me and said, uh, sorry, told me that I had to be involved in this today was that um, we had to come up with a question. So the question we thought of is quite straightforward. So can you help us to identify an improved method of identifying stroke prioritizing which acoustic log logger levels and spreads so the combination of them both will result in a leak being present when we actually send the guy out to investigate? Okay, that's it. Well, I'm hoping Rob will answer them. Okay, so um, fascinating. And I think there's, a f there's lots of things going on there. The future of work, the future of data, how software and data is impacting on infrastructure. It's, it's, it's fascinating. But are there any questions that we'd like to go. So we've got a question over there. If you'd hang there a second, we have got another microphone somewhere. So everyone can hear. If you just say who you are, where you're from, and your question. Uh, yeah, Gordon Squire from Decision Lab. We're a um, data science consultancy uh, working in the water sector. Uh, the question was, do you have data on actual leaks that you've detected? So obviously you've got the logger data, but it would be useful to correlate that with. We do, I believe, Rob. That's correct, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, as part of the upload, what we've done is we've sampled uh, some of the alarm, uh, loggers that were in alarm, and we've captured whether there was a leak or not, and we've been out to look at those. And we've also been out and sampled around about 15 or so, maybe 20, where they're not in alarm, but just below that threshold at varying degrees. So there's a, f a full... Uh, balanced picture, if you like, of whether a leak's been found, a leak's not been found, and depending on where that was in the threshold. So that's all been uploaded as well onto Data Mill North. Imagine. One other tiny quick question was um, just for my own interest where does um, like household smart meter data fit into this picture of detecting leaks? No, it, at the moment, it's not picked up as part of what we do. So okay. it's not featured in what we've released, and it's not something at the moment that we utilize in our leakage detection. Certainly not on the acoustic log inside of it. Cool. Cheers. Julian, do you have a, a view on uh, where we came out at the end of last year? Two hundred ninety-seven point one megalitres a day, on average across the year. But last year, with the uh, weather issues that we had in December and March, we we had to increase resources quite a lot. But we we just failed that target, unfortunately. So I think we'll be around about three hundred. But uh, so it's quite difficult to control in uh, severe weather conditions, especially when you can't actually get out to find the leaks because you can't get onto the streets and things like that, because it is a reactive, a react, completely reactive thing. Uh, of, of our total water into supply. So typically, I think we're about between 1,200 and 1,300 megalitres a day. So it's quite a high proportion that we report as leakage. Okay, we've got, we got a question down here. We'll pass the mic over. Uh, Martin Spires, RPS. Um, have you tried looking at um, predicting where, where you might have leaks or done any correlation between where you've had leaks and things that you might expect to cause them, like the age of the pipes or the depth of them? Yeah, so we, we do deterioration modeling that, that accounts for that kind of thing. So we have an understanding of the probability of each individual pipe bursting. Uh, but a lot of the probabilities in any individual pipe are quite low. 
Uh, so to put that in context, there's around 800,000 pipes across Yorkshire, and our annual burst rate is around the sort of 6,000 mark, something like that. So if you just look at an average pipe, it's got less than a 1% chance of bursting in any given year. Uh, so as such, we're comparing lots of small numbers. Now, at a DMA level, they do add up, but and in, in on an individual pipe level, they um, are very, very small. So we do utilize that information, yes, but when it comes to finding and fixing the leaks, the probability change between pipe A and pipe B, and given if you're in a DMA, they're probably laid at the same time, so it's hard to differentiate. Uh, there often can't be much graduation, so it's, it's not been something that we've used typically operationally when we go in to look for the leaks. Thank you. Okay. Any more questions over here? We've got one over here, so I'll just take that. Thank you. Hi. Uh, this may fit into the category of sort of dumb question, but how do you calculate the 297? 297.1 millilitres per day? Yeah. Megalitres. <laughs> All right, okay. Um, you want to ask, ask them both at the same I'll time? I'll ask the second one. Uh, just in terms of that, do you know the split between, or do you have a sense of the split between that of that 297? What is new incidences, i.e. a pipe bursting, versus what is legacy? I, it's been there for years, you've just never found it and you're trying to find it. I couldn't split that information for you at the moment. I'd have to go away and work that out. But I think we could give you like a background leakage level and what's variable on top of that. Chris might have a little bit more information on that. But the way we report leakage, so out of the DMAs that Rob explained earlier, we report through a system called NetBase and we, we report a number from NetBase on what is leakage in DMAs. And I can't just remember what that number was this time. David, are you, can you remember what came out of NetBase? Two, in terms of di about 243 megalitres across the DMAs. Now we have, we have an upstream network above that, which is trunk mains and service reservoirs. So we also report leakage for those. So on our trunk main system, we report currently 35 to 36 megalitres a day. Now that's based on quite a low sample as well. And then our service reservoir leakage, which can form two, two distinct parts. One is overflow when we've lost control of the inlet, which is very small, probably about 0.15 megalitres. And then there's leakage from the structure itself, which we've re recorded about 1.5 megalitres a day on average. So it's, it's a combination of those three things. But we also then compare that number across that bottom-up leakage we then compare that into a table which is top-down leakage. So we look at all our water into supply. We take off all our commercial and domestic uh, measured consumers. We also then have a, uh, an allowance that we add in uh, on a per capita consumption basis from our 1,000 property sample that we use for night use as well. And then we, we multiply that by all our unmeasured domestic customers. So we then take all those volumes from our water into supply. We also then reduce, take off our reported leakage or our calculated leakage from bottom up. And then we see what the difference is and that difference is unaccounted for water, which we then apportion back and then that extra allowance is put back onto leakage. So it's quite a complicated way of actually calculating the final number. So what, but what we're inter really interested in at the moment is leakage in DMAs and how we manage that better. If you okay. Wish. Yeah. Thanks and very much. So, just I've got a question: Is all that data published? We've I th don't, we haven't published. Ooh, I, d I don't know what gets re published on the APR. Going to say is it, yeah, it'll be published as part of our annual returns. Yeah. Great. So you publish it as annual. So we'd be be really good to have a, a regular update published to a data mill similar to that, wouldn't it? Mm. Okay. I'm just writing down extra stuff. So. Calvin's got a question. Excuse just, uh, sorry, Carver just to pick up uh, on the second question that you asked. Yeah. Um, you were asking about uh, how much is the uh, background leakage effectively. So um, leakage is split into two areas. There's what's known as background leakage. So that's what you can't currently find with known technology. Um, our level for that is around about 150, 155 megalitres, something like that. 
So the rest of our leakage in theory, and I use that word theory, would be achievable. However, to get right down to that 150, 155, you would need someone stood right by every pipe, so when it bursts, we could immediately fix it. So there's got to be a balance between what we do now and that unpragmatic state to be. No, so to night. No, no, so to, to well, that's, that's your background. That's the lowest level you can get to. Over the space of a year, leakage grows. We have, we, there's a figure called natural rate of rise. So that's how much, if you didn't do anything on the network, how much it would rise by if, if you didn't touch anything. And that's, Chris, that's around 90 to 140 megalitres, is it? So, so every year, we're at, if we did nothing, we'd add another half again, another third to a half back onto our leakage level. So to maintain levels, we have to knock that much off every year to just stand still. Okay. Jude's got a question. Okay. So if you could give that uh, microphone to Jude. So if you can ask your question, and then Cara, if you can ask your question. All right, let's go. Um, presumably you're mapping sort of pressure levels over all your information, pressure, pipe pressure data. So, so geographical components to allow you to focus in and will that, is that all available with all this data as well? No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so we, ha we have the uh, night pressure for each of our, our different zones and that's taken into account in assessing what the target should be in each area. So uh, we haven't published it as yet. What you see in here is just the first cut of data that we have published. So if it's one of the data sets that we're after, it's something we can look into providing in the future. We, sorry, we also use pressure data to calculate the daily leakage value. So in an area, pressure will vary between day and night depending upon hydraulic conditions, and we work out the proportion. So we have what's called an hour-day factor. So when we worked out the leakage on the night line, that will give us quite a high value because pressures are high, so we adjust that because pressures come down when flows go up in the day. So we have an hour-day factor, and typically, David, that's we've reported this year at, 23.47, so it's not quite 24 hours, so we reduce it slightly to, to s s allow for that uh, pressure variation. Fantastic. So I just, um, these, these are some of the data files that are up on the, oh, Cara, Cara have you got a no, question? Uh, yeah. It was just on the subject, uh, just um, of, of calculating your methods. Uh, Acquia have um, released a number of reports summarizing the state of um, the industry on that, and it would just maybe be useful, um, particularly, I, I, we're looking at Yorkshire Water's data today, but to make anybody's results more generally, generally applicable, it might be useful to, to consult that document if you wanted to have more um, detailed understanding of how this stuff's calculated so in Cara, the background. So, Cara, just explain who you are and where you're from. So that oh, yeah, sorry. Um, I'm Cara Hazelgrave. I'm the Research and Innovation Development Manager for Water at Leeds. So I work up at the university with all of the water researchers uh, across all the different faculty. And we haven't produced this. This is uh, the UK Water Industry Research Body, which has recently just chosen to summarize uh, leakage and the issues around leakage in a set of papers. So there's six papers available freely online. I think we've sent the links through to you already, but it just sort of shows you where the entire UK industry sits with regard to this topic and it spreads across how you calculate in one document and then how, uh, what some of the latest novel techniques for solutions are in some of the other documents. So, um, oh. You just might want to have a look. That's fantastic and we'll put that on the hub page and the links to that so we can do that. So um, I've got a quick, so we've already picked up some data that we'd love to release. So pressure yeah. distribution by geography, that would be, I think that's, yeah, GDPR doesn't come into that. Um, I doubt it, no. <laughs> but it seems that uh, because reasons GDPR comes into a lot of things, but that would be a, that's a really good um, request for the next data set, which I think would be really useful. Um, and then um, I've just got a question. If, could you just do a quick run through the data and explain the headings yes. for us? That, yeah. would be, that would be really good. Um, and... Explain how DMA5, we've, we've issued a data set of where the DMAs are as well, haven't we? So Yeah, we have, yeah. yeah. So that's good. Any more questions before we go through that, before Rob takes us through the data? 
Great stuff. So quick 30 seconds explanation yeah. explainer on the data, and then we can get some coffee, and then we can start about talking about themes and teams. OK, uh, I've just made it disappear. Can you bring it back? <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so this is what the bulk of the data looks like. There's 20 files that look like this, so picking this first row. This is an anonymized DMA. Uh, we've had to anonymize them in the first instance. Uh, so you can see here DMA number five. And what you're looking at is a 15-minute flow for DMA number five. All of these on this first page that you can see here cover the 1st of April 2016. So reading across for this first one, between... Uh, the period midnight and quarter past, there was 2.667 litres of, uh, I think that's litres, I'll come back and check that, litres of water used, and the validity code around that uh, is a V there, so showing that that was valid in our calculation. So, I was going to say, I don't think it's litres, what's the unit? Do litres per second, beg your pardon, litres per second. So that was the litres per second used in that area. So each one of these is the litres per second used across each of those 15-minute periods for that DMA. Sorry? Dave, do you want to uh, input on that? Uh, so because we've got multiple components of flow, so in a DMA you might have inlet and outlet meters. It's valid just means it's got all the components, all the inlets and all the outlets there. So if it was invalid, you might have the inlet flow into the area, but not an outlet going into another area. So if we, so there's other data as well. We've got the, yeah. So these are the DMAs. Yes, yeah, so these are the property counts. So these are exactly what I showed in my presentation, Paul. So this yep. is just showing the number of households and the number of commercial properties within each DMA. I'm not sure how frequently it's updated. Dave will be able to answer that. But just before we answer that bit of it, these figures here relate to the financial year that the data, the flow data relates to. So these should be commensurate with what you see in there. But how frequently is it updated, Dave? So we, ac um, we actually import the uh, property data monthly into NetBase, but that is an average for that year, for that reporting year. You're talking about the growth and the, the change in properties yeah, in each DMA? Do you want to put it on the list and we'll look into it? Well, so yeah, I'll get the list there. So this yeah. is the I think DMA to postal sector there? Yeah, yeah so this is, uh, as shown in the presentation, the list of postal sectors in each DMA. So in DMA 1, you can see here it covers two postal sectors. Uh, and you can see it's LS81 and LS82. In the first one, there's 55 household properties and seven commercial, and you can see the numbers uh, for the other postal sector there. So when you're looking at the flow for that DMA, you'll be able to see what the key constituents are in that flow, and ultimately you'll be able to calculate some weighting between these that's relevant to whatever you're looking at. So this tells us where the DMAs are, basically. It tells you where they are and the number of properties in it. Yeah. Okay, and then I'm just going back. We've got on this. This is there's also the mains repair data on that other one. Yeah. So this is just a list showing all the mains repairs that occurred in that full financial year across each of the DMAs in the extract. So if you hold it still for a second, then you can see there were three mains repairs on DMA 15, and you can see the dates that those repairs occurred. Fantastic. So also, what we've, we've got the uh, daily acoustic yeah, if logger data. Yeah, you want data. to go into that, I'll talk yeah. through those. So this first table shows for each 
uh, acoustic logger we've got out there, it shows the level and spread recorded for each different day. So it's just a table, two lines for each site capturing that level and spread. You will see there are some gaps in this. This is because this project is literally recently just got off the ground. I think the first date we started recording was I think the 7th of February. So some of these sites, like site four for example, hasn't started recording data yet when we took this extract on the 2nd of May. And there was, yeah, okay, we've got these are the leak alarm results. Yeah, so this is the final data set we've uploaded at the moment. So these show you, it's a, it's a table showing what we've been out to investigate, so it links to the question you were asking before. So the first column shows whether the site was in leak alarm. So if you just scroll to the bottom, Paul, there should be a few that uh, weren't in leak alarm. There'll be a few that weren't in leak alarm. There we go. Yeah. There we go. So these are the ones we've proactively checked to try and bring some data here to understand whether our thresholds look too tight or too loose, etc. So that's what we've picked up here. Then reading across, you can see the idea of the site uh, that we've looked at, the date we visited it, and then whether we actually found a leak. And there's three elements in that end column. Leak found is either yes, we've found one, no, we haven't, or no, but there's a PRV. So as Jason mentioned, if there's a, a PRV or a pressure reducing valve within the area, it will also make a noise. So it's not so much that that's been a, a rogue reading in itself, it's just the fact that it's picked up, something's going on, but it's that pressure reducing valve rather than a burst. Fantastic. And then just to add to that, there are other data sets that Yorkshire Water have been uploading previously. So there was some domestic consumption monitoring monthly meet that was updated. Uh, a year ago, there's some information about the reservoirs, the information and investment fee. Sorry, excuse me, sorry, can I ask a question? Sorry. Oh yeah, push uh, Cowan. Lawrence Cowan from ASI Data Science. I was just wondering, um, how do we link the acoustic loggers to some sort of location? Is yeah, they, so the problem with the acoustic loggers is they are actually on property stop taps. So we've not been able to put the location details on that data. The intention with us, uh, with that data, as Jason's alluded to, is effectively what we're trying to understand is with the, the level and spread information that we've got released now, is there a better way of utilizing that to just try and understand where we'd be better deploying resources? So it's, it's coming at it pretty much within itself is that challenge. The other data set, though, can be linked with any other data you want because yeah. uh, we've got that geographic locator in there, so that can be joined up. So, th so the question, the, I guess the exam question around the, the acoustic loggers is, is what level is a real leak and what's not yeah. not have we got other factors around geography or location in there uh, but they're on actual people's homes aren't they um, yes that's where the um, is it the stop tap where yeah yeah, yeah. right so okay. so, yeah um, we can probably add the DMA at some point but what you've got to remember is the acoustic loggers, like I said, they've only just gone in. So the data that's coming out from that isn't going to be able to be linked with the stuff we've provided for the DMAs because they're in two slightly different time periods. So you've got to bear with us on this and the fact that this is the first lot of data we've provided and prepared. And getting to this stage has been quite a sizable challenge. But in future, the idea will be to provide more linkage between the data sets and have them over the same time periods. So that's brilliant. So we've got five more questions about more data we could release already. And what did we, we had a chat yesterday that we'd, we'd get these questions. And, yeah, yeah. and we were pretty sure that we were quite covered, but that's, that's the beauty of uh, open innovation. So Fantastic. Question so another question. Yeah. I, I think you just sort of answered my question. I was going to ask about where you had deployed the acoustic loggers already. You said you've only deployed half of the, your, the stock of loggers. Presumably yeah. there's more than one in each DMA. And have you already targeted those? you know, where you've put those acoustic loggers. So have you put them into zones where you've already got a high night line or something already? No, we've, we've put them into zones where you know, we mentioned natural rate of rise. Right. So we know with the DMAs they are, so we've got, we've got 60 foot across Yorkshire, which is about 60 foot across Yorkshire. Uh, not just for everyone else. Um, the 62 across Yorkshire that was selected originally. With me starting the team up from scratch very much Bradford based, we, start, we started with the local ones right. first and we've worked out from there. So it was all on the natural rate of rise. So the zones that we go into traditionally, find the leak, 
repair the leak, the night line goes down, and then it's off again. Yeah, so you, you move the acoustic loggers around. So no, no, the acoustic loggers are permanently they're permanent. deployed. So uh, is it a case that the acu there's you haven't got any acoustic loggers in zones where you know they're fairly tight and you know there's not a At lot of At the moment, yeah. Right, Remember, okay. we only started this in January. Right. Okay, I'll just that, that, that data set then sort of biased towards leaking areas as opposed to ones that aren't leaking. Hopefully. Areas with natural rate of rise, yeah. yeah. And, and just a, a question, so you've got, a, is it 5,000 loggers you're going to put in? 4,500 okay. initially. Initially, and how many do you think you're going to deploy eventually? Hopefully up to 40,000. 40, so that's going to be quite a comprehensive... Big job for my team. Yeah. And a big data management job and a big... Uh, and if it's all going to be published openly, that's fantastic because we'll, we'll innovate much quicker uh, doing it that way. Fantastic. We've got another question here, which I'll just pass the microphone. Oh, Amy's got that microphone. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, Anushin from Arup. I just one question about the acoustic loggers and your current alarm mode. You said it was noise level minus noise spread and a number of 15 or more uh, activates the alarm. Where does that come from? Is that kind of experience based or does that come from the manufacturer? That's come from the man manufacturers and experience in other companies. Okay, because on a general, because I guess the noise level is a decibel reading and the noise spread is just a number, which is unitless. So to get 15 is... Uh, yeah, yeah, it's the number of different noises at different levels that it got okay. in that reading. Okay, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, the, the spread is measured in decibels as well. Okay. Yeah. Fantastic. Any more questions? Great. Oh, we've got one question, and, and I'm going to say, does anyone need a cup of tea, coffee? I'm, I'm sort of getting there. Um, what is the, the kind of rationale behind the acoustic loggers? So are they sending off data, or are they just purely listening, and you're expecting a kind of constant decibel flow noise from a typical pipe, but if there's a leak, you're getting other frequencies of noises at different frequencies yeah I, I think if I understand your question correctly you're asking does yeah. a leak cause a noise on a pipe work is, is that yeah. the sort of so question you're I guess just like a perfect pipe would just be this kind of constant the, there should noise. be a, the constant uh, background at noise at of the flow going through it or uh, a certain join. decibel yeah I couldn't tell you what, what, what that is. decibel yeah but then if, if there's kind of bits of the pipe that are messed up or weird noises you're getting other sounds on the on the pipe, which that's are, correct. Yeah, you know, you're getting high frequencies or, or low frequencies, and, and therefore you, the overall sound recorded is sort of spread out. It and, is, and yeah. But it doesn't we sound like that. Very rarely perfect. see a consistent straight line of yeah. noise level and noise spread. So, so do people understand how people used to listen for leaks before? Do we all know that? So what happens with noise, a very small leak can uh, cause a very high frequency noise. So you might have heard that when you're operating your tap, so you open it a little bit and it starts hissing. So what you can do is get a very high frequency, and then, but it might be a very low level leak. Then when frequency goes down, it generally tends to mean there's less head loss or less differential head across the leak. So then the, the frequency comes right down and that can be impacted by the type of material, whether it's plastic. So a leak that's going to an open end without passing through anything other than the, the pipe itself will virtually make no noise. So if a main breaks its back because there's a bit of ground movement, all of a sudden you might generate a very low frequency noise. And, and that's part of the art of using the noise loggers is to understand what sort of leak you've got, where it is on the frequency range, and when you should maybe react to it. In, in my mind, what we should be doing is once we've got the noise loggers out, we'll be managing that DMA on noise loggers rather than on leakage. So we'll be looking to react to noises as they occur. So as a leak starts and then maybe grows a little bit, you'll be able to see that maybe it goes down in its frequency a little bit as the leak becomes larger. So it's, it's those sort of trends and things that we need to look at. And is it worth going to an immediate leak if it's very high frequency? It might only be a very, very small leak. So we need to understand all those things. It's very early days and 
Jason, Jason's going through this, deploying the loggers, working out what all the background issues are, trying to baseline the DMA so that from that point on, we're reacting to something that's a, you know, that's something new or unusual on the network. Yeah. And Jason, just to explain what people used before data loggers, the acoustic loggers. Before acoustic loggers. Yeah. Listening sticks. So. A uh, metal or a wooden stick with an earpiece on the end that they would um, walk around the DMA, lift the lids up on the valves, fire hydrants, stop taps, and listen and listen for the, the vibration of the noise coming through that stick. There's other things as well used, like a correlator that I mentioned yeah. to help yeah, yeah, yeah. the pinpointing, but the, the main tool of the leakage inspector was and still is to some extent because we still need that man on the ground to put that mark down where that leak is and listening on the top surface where there's no fittings, it's still a listening stick. Thank you. So Duncan, we'll take, we'll take maybe one more point or question and then we'll have some tea, I think, or coffee. Uh, yeah, uh, I just wanted to ask, a, maybe this is a naive question, but um, do you record, you've got flow rate and you've got pressure, are both of those elements within the data sets? We record both, but we haven't uploaded the pressure. That's the first time pressure's actually been mentioned, but I can't foresee an issue with releasing okay. pressure. Okay, so at the moment, people are working currently on flow rates, not pressure to determine where leaks are within this room. Y yeah, uh, from what we've, what we've got there. Well, I mean, to be fair, what we've shown there is the standard industry practice. So across the entire industry, flow rates are what's used to identify and detect leakage. But uh, so we could, um, how long would it take to get the pressure added as a, a, a column in that table? Uh, it won't be a column. It'll be not disproportionate to the size of the flow data. So we'll have to have a think about what that looks like and what so we can do. So can I just expand on the, the pressure a little bit? So in each DMA, we, we have to try and measure the pressure at the highest point because of standards of service. Yep. So we are guaranteeing that we are delivering a minimum pressure in the network at the highest property. That, that makes sure we are compliant with our DG2 obligations. DG2. So that is pressure received by the customer. So yep. this, the actual standard is nine litres a minute at 10 metres head at the customer's boundary. And we have a surrogate, surrogate for that, which is 15 metres head in the main to allow for head losses to the boundary. So. Mm -hmm we typically are using pressures to manage that function rather than necessarily contribute towards leakage. So typically we'll only have one pressure logger in a DMA and we don't cover all DMAs with pressure. So not every DMA has got a complete yeah, yeah, set of pressure yeah. data. Fantastic. So I think that ends the A-level physics um, <laughs> lesson. Uh, so if what we'll do, if we'll have a, we'll have a break, have a cup of tea, start thinking about some of the challenges and might, what we want to think about. Do we want to look at flow data, acoustic data, leaks, behavior change, that sort of thing. But it's all about helping Yorkshire Water meet their, what's your leak uh, re reduction target? 40%. A 40% reduction in leakage by? Uh, the next seven years. Seven years, so. Uh, 2025. Yeah. 2025, so it's not long, is it? Yeah, of course. <laughs> yes. So a real life challenge. And remember, as Richard said, the um, the prototypes, anything we build tomorrow, will get put in front of the uh, the Yorkshire Water Board. And um, I know because I've been pestering Yorkshire Water is how can a large, quite conservative um, uh, body that has very um, entrenched and you know, very important supply chains take advantage of new and innovative things that will be built um, and suggested here. So um, it, they're on a journey on that um, uh, route as well. So uh, tea, coffee, orange juice, um, and then get back in about 20 minutes and we'll start the next session. Thank you. Round of applause for our data people. <laughs>